All right. So, hello and welcome everyone to who's ever listening to this particular podcast. I am Jay Shah and I'm a PhD student at Arizona State University and through this podcast I invite people who are working in tech in different roles, uh be it an engineer, researcher, product manager, professor or entrepreneur and talk more about their journey and how to get started with it and share some insights along these lines that they have worked. And um for this particular podcast I have Linda Zhang who is a product lead at the fair and in the past she has worked and interned at snap microsoft uh, and few other places and also graduated from the harvard university she has a tremendous amount of experience uh, on pro- product management and she also uh, maintains a very nice list of resources for people who want to get started with it through her newsletter and other things that she has been working that we'll be covering in this podcast she has tremendous amount of uh, lessons that i have personally learned uh, learned and uh, followed her work on twitter and so please help me in welcoming so uh linda thanks for being here and uh it's really nice to have you yeah thanks for having me jay all right so so trying to learn more about your background as in can you talk more about what was your background before you had uh, your first pm role and how did you make that transition into your product manager role over here Yeah so I've done a variety of things um in school I I actually studied biology I thought I was going to be a doctor <laughs> along with I guess most people who start off in school and then midway through I realized that I didn't want to you know go down the medical school path and instead I wanted to you know try my hand at tech and that's when I um got an internship at Microsoft that was my first taste of you know actually uh being part of a company whose whole mission is to just build things for people Um I thought that was super interesting. Uh but then right out of, out of college actually I I went into consulting. And the reason why I started off in consulting instead of going straight into tech is because I felt like as a new grad I just didn't know enough um about the world to truly make a decision. Like I felt like I would be more challenged if I did um a, a, like a more of a boot camp type job, which consulting certainly is. It's definitely definitely kicked my butt in a lot of ways. Um but also learned a ton. Um but in that process I realized okay I want to get back into what I enjoy most which is being close to products and being in technology. But as you and probably many others know, getting into product without official product experience is actually pretty tough. Um there's a lot of people who want to get into these roles, there's not that many roles compared to, you know, engineering or design even. We can talk about why that is. And so I had a lot of trouble breaking in. And so the first thing I did actually was um going go into a market research consumer analytics role at Snapchat so that got me a little bit closer to kind of where the action all happened and then about a year in i had the opportunity to um talk to uh the founder of a really early stage company at the time it was called Indigo Fair now it's called Fair it's grown a lot over the last few years and i started off uh in a product analytics role basically similar to my background but within a couple of weeks uh basically transition into into OPM and I think the lesson that I take from that is oftentimes these roles pop up when there's a real business need for it and if you can be the person who's there who's built trust and credibility um oftentimes you can actually get that opportunity that you wouldn't be able to get otherwise without you know official experience and so that's kind of how it all came together right right and and as, as i browse through the uh, these things that you said it seems like you have started at a very uh, big big workspace companies for example microsoft snap and fair itself uh, is a is one of those uh, companies and one of your recent articles did talk about you turned down an offer at instagram which is again a definitely a step up if you if you see in terms of workspaces can you can you talk us through your mindset that you had before you had the offer that that means you applied for that offer and what did really change for you from your perspective once you had the offer and you turned down so what was the difference between these two mindsets over there mm-hmm. yeah so the instagram opportunity came um kind of out of the blue i mean it uh, could have reached out to me a few years into my tenure at fair at that point i already had experience and was sort of managing pms so i had more credibility i guess in 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 the real world and so they reached out and i was interested just me cur- mostly curious i wasn't thinking of um leaving the company or joining another company but in the interview process i actually was pretty impressed by the people that i met and the specific team that they wanted me to work on was the instagram reels team which of course is still relatively new 
um, came as kind of a response to the TikTok, um, the rise of TikTok. And so I became more emotionally invested <laughs> along the process, which I, I suppose is also the goal, right? Of when you're interviewing a candidate, you want to make them feel more excited over the process. And so towards the end, you know, they gave me an offer, I think it was around $300,000 for an L5 PM role, which is a specific level within the overall, um, within the overall org. And I did some research. I wanted to do some benchmarking to figure out, you know, is this a good offer? Is this not a good offer? And, you know, I'm fortunate to know a lot of people in the company and know people who have information on what's a good offer, what is it? And I quickly realized that this is actually pretty much like on the lower end of the spectrum. And I was like, oh, I mean, there's definitely room for negotiation if I'm gonna take this offer, uh, especially because at FAIR, you know, it's, it's a private company and most of the, my compensation is tied up in um, illiquid stock options, but they're worth a lot, especially at this point. And so I would be walking away from quite a bit of money. And it's usually on the company who's trying to win you over, it's on them to make it easy to walk away from your present situation. And so that's, that was how the whole kind of, I guess, story uh, started where I was like, okay, I'm going to start negotiating. And I was very upfront with them around like how much I was leaving behind and what it would take for me to, um, you know, bite the bullet and, and join the team. And the, the first thing I learned was at a bigger company like Facebook, like Instagram, they have a whole team, like con I think it's called the compensation review team, where their whole job is to uh, put checks and balances in place for these negotiations. And so they also do their research. They have a lot more data than I do. And they figure out what is the appropriate amount to give. Um, and so it was a lot of back and forth with people that I had you know, never even met. It's kind of like a black box. Um, and we went back and forth and back and forth to the point where I think we got to like $350,000. And I was like, look, I, I think the line that I'm going to draw is 400K. Um, I will sign today. And the reason why I said that was because I was ready to sign. Um, but I wanted, I wanted a figure that would make me feel comfortable walking away from something that I also knew was really good, which is my current set of options. And so that was, I was very explicit. And the hiring manager um, was pretty excited about it. it. Was like, okay, let's do it. Um, we're gonna make this happen. And over the weekend, I think they were talking about how to make it happen. And then they came back to me and finally said, look, like this isn't possible because um, your current company is private. And so we don't value your stock options in the same way. So it was all these rules that nobody could control, including the people who wanted me to be on the team. And I think I finally just like realized that if it's this hard to make something as simple as this happen, it just isn't really, it's not the kind of place that I would be happy in. I'm more of a, I'm more of a no BS person. <laughs> and so I think all of the, you know, the rules and, and all of that stuff is just not a, a good fit for me. And I was actually kind of relieved um, to know, to understand that because it's better to know that before you join than to join and think you're getting into something that really isn't what you actually want. So that's kind of how the whole thing went so, down. So, so I guess in a way, were you concerned about the kind of freedom that you would get as a product manager while working over there, you would lose what you have at FAIR right now. So is mm -hmm. it kind of, uh, kind of like kind of the uh, freedom that you would get as in, in executing your decisions would be limited if it's 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 if it's limited that much in the compensation area. Yeah, that's exactly right. I think it was um you know it was a a, a window into what life would be like on the right. inside. And you know, people who clearly have a lot of sway um and are hiring, you know, hiring people can't make certain calls, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Um, then who am I to be able to make the call and, and change things, right? Like, I'm not going to be able to do that, so. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. And if we, if we try to strip down for a moment all these companies and just talk about product management in general to learn more about it, what have you noticed in general your in, in the domain of product management? What are the different stages that you can definitely say, regardless of the product, if it's a tech product or a design product or something related to tech, but definitely there are different types of tech products. What can you say about what are the most common stages? For example, stage number one, stage number two, and stage number three. For example, in development, software development, we have these stages, right? So... Can you talk about what are the uh, at least minimum amount of stages that you go through across 
from that point that you have an inception of idea or I, I don't know if idea is the real right word but once once your role starts versus when you can say hey I'm done with this particular um, assignment whatever I was given so mm-hmm. what are the stages in between that yeah so I think it really varies I mean product management is kind of an ambiguous term I know it's it's definitely a role that's heated up over the last few years um, but the truth is that depending on what company you work for and the stage of the company, the role of a PM and like the way that products are built is drastically different. There are no, um, there's no text, there's no like set of rules that everybody follows. And for good reason, right? There's just so many ways in which you could go about it. Some of which are good, some of which are not good. Um, and so I think it really depends. I mean, if you want to break it down into pretty simple terms, there's, there's a zero to one phase where there's a new idea and maybe you're a new company, maybe you're a new team with an existing company um, and you want to do something that you've never done before. That's kind of called the zero to one phase because you the only thing you have is an idea and you want to turn it from nothing to something that actually exists. And so that's a whole phase and it does require, I think, a different skill set. Um, so in the zero to one phase, you know, you don't have a lot of data necessarily because nothing's been launched yet. And so I think the skill that's most important is around, you know, uh, curiosity about the market, about the customers, and really being able to talk to the people that you think um, you could help and teasing out what exactly could be useful. Um, and I think a thing that um, that's not often talked about enough is there's what people say, and then there's what people actually uh, believe, right? And people don't always say what they believe, not because they don't want to tell you, but because they themselves may not know the solution. So the customers, I feel like, always know the problem they're, they're, they're facing pretty well, especially if it's an important problem, um, but they may not always know what the exact solution should look like because solutions are always, you know, just um, based off your personal experience, what you've seen before, and people have different sets of experiences. And so I think the skill of taking um, that curiosity and figuring out what is a solution that you can make a first version of a solution. How do you create that first version, that MVP? That's really crucial in zero to one. Um, I think that the big misconception perhaps is that zero to one actually doesn't happen very often, especially if you're working in a big company. Like most of what you do is just making what you're currently doing um, either not degrading quality or a little bit better. Right. And so um, I think being clear about what role you're stepping into is actually pretty important, especially if you have some experience and you want a specific type of experience that you may or may not get, depending on the environment that you're in. Uh, But one to N is usually what everybody else does. Um, So it's like you build something and now, you know, people have to maintain it. People have to make it slightly better. Maybe you want to release this into, um, you know, a different market. Uh, Maybe you want to expand your offering. Um, and add on some additional features or something like that. That uh, requires a different skill set, right? You're looking into probably a lot more data. Um, you actually have a lot of customers to talk to. Uh, there's a little bit more, I think, reservation in changing too much because you don't want to alienate your existing customers. Um, so you have to think, you have to put on almost like a different lens. Um, and I think that you know people who really love the zero to one phase and are really good at that oftentimes will get bored <laughs> with the one to end because uh, it's just such a different type of mentality. And um, so I think you, you need, you know, different mindsets uh, at different stages of the company, but it really, really does, you know, vary because no, no one person follows the exact same set of um, playbook. Yeah, I I I I, I want to dig into more on on those phases. But you started off the answer by saying uh, it has been the the rise of product management, the hot shot of being product management roles are, has been increasing in the last few years. Why do you think that has been like like maybe I guess maybe ten years back? I mean, I I was pretty young, so I I, I might not know about the industry much. But uh, I we didn't see a lot of product management roles at least ten years back, or at least it, they were very specific roles over there. Why do you think they are product management specific roles have increased in a lot of sector and you can be specific about tech if that's uh, that could be based on your experience why do you think that is yeah i mean it it certainly wasn't nearly like when i was in school i didn't know what a pm was right <laughs> and most people didn't even like we some a few people knew that there were these apm openings at google or rpm openings at facebook but the predominant like 
prestigious jobs, so to speak, was still investment banking consulting. I think the last few years, it really has, uh, it's at least on my end, you know, I'm not that young, but it feels like it's, it's changed. I think that part of it is the mythology that a PM is the CEO. I think that people really like the glamour of it, of, oh, you get to call the shots, you get to, you know, you can be a 22 year old CEO and you get to fail on someone else's dime. So I think maybe part of it is purely the mythology. And I say it's a myth because actually um, it's still varies by company, but pretty much all of the time, unless you're actually the CEO, the PM is not the CEO, right? You're not managing anyone, especially if you're an individual contributor. <laughs> the designers do not report to you. The engineers do not report to you. Nobody reports to you. So no, you are not the CEO, but you know, in, a, in an environment where the product team is empowered, you can, as an individual contributor, really shape and influence what gets built um, in certain scenarios. And so in that, in that respect, you are calling the shots in some ways. But I think that calling, you know, the PM, the CEO can often lead to the wrong, you know, the wrong kinds of behavior of like, oh, suddenly you're the boss. You're, no, definitely not. Right. So um, I think the role is over glamorized. Um, I think there's a lot more, it, it sounds a lot cooler than it actually is. I would say the day-to-day -day realities of PM is uh, mostly rooted in execution. It's, you know, doing the work, writing the docs, testing the product, um, working with design to make sure the pixels look right. And uh, I think knowing that going in is important. And if, if that's something people enjoy, and I think a lot of people enjoy, I certainly enjoy it, then it's going to be a great result. If it's, you know, if it's really about, oh, I just want to build cool ideas, mm, that role may not necessarily be the right fit for you, especially if, um, you know, uh, you go from someone who has never built any products to suddenly, I want to build an next billion dollar idea. Usually it doesn't happen that way. Like most people that you see who've <laughs> gone out there and done cool things, like they've, <laughs> they've failed in, you know, in silence and obscurity for so long before they got to that point. And so I think setting the right expectations um, is important. Maybe another reason why people think it's cool is because it's pretty exclusive. So there are not that many um, PM openings. I think typically the ratio in a team, the product development team, is you have uh, maybe like 10, 15 engineers. You might have one to two designers um, and at most like one PM, if that, right? There are some teams with no PMs. And so the ratio is stacked in such a way because of like the role that you actually play in the team that if there's just, you know, there's a lot more people who want it than people who there are openings for those qualified people. And so, you know, I think there's a little bit of like a lure of, oh, you know, you're in this really cool position that so few people are actually able to get into. Maybe that's, you know, that's part of it too. Yeah, that makes sense. I guess the idea of managing something that you can control in its uh, inception to execution really motivates people to be, uh, and I guess, uh, in, at least in tech uh, tech industry, I guess, because we are seeing a huge outburst in the use of these tech products, be it an app or some kind of a physical tool. So I guess having to say or maybe brag about it, that gratification factor that you get, I was the manager for being that or building mm -hmm. that particular tech product really motivates these people. Yeah, so, so. I think that's a good way of putting it. Like I certainly, you know, I went into it because I wanted to get closer to um, like the building without yeah. actually building. <laughs> like, I, I mean, I, I don't know how to code and I don't know how to design. I'm better at all of those things now because I've had exposure to it. But, you know, without having the ability to actually do it, but still being able to add value in prioritizing and figuring out, you know, what the future could look like, that is very interesting you know, to a lot of people, but it's not always, the day-to-day -day may not always be pretty. Yeah. And, and trying to side back the two phases that we talked uh, earlier, uh, the zero to one and the one to n. And I guess uh, this falls in the, the next question falls into, I guess, in the zero to one that I particularly read a lot about these things that uh, having an empathy as a skill for product management is really useful. But one thing that I as a very naive uh, person and definitely from a completely tech background, so I, I lack that uh, empathy or understanding of empathy in its, in, in its first place. Can you tell us what does this empathy as a skill really mean? Like what does it translate to your uh, real wo world scenario where you're working as a uh, product management role for building a product how does it really mean i mean we understand what empathy is but how do you translate it into a professional setting uh, as your work role mm -hmm. yeah i think there's empathy for your customers there's also empathy for your team 
And I think we can talk about empathy with it for customers first. So most people, I think most people are building products for people that are not themselves. Uh, and I think when that happens, when you're not building for someone like you, you uh, need to step out of your own head and actually try to step into the shoes of somebody else. And so what that, you know, the, the form in which that takes place is instead of, um, instead of thinking we have all of these tools and we can build this cool new thing, uh, instead of starting with solution, I, a cool solution that I believe in, you instead need to think about who are, who are our customers if we do have customers. And if we don't have customers, who are the kinds of people that we believe we can add some value towards? Uh, and then actually spend time with those people, really figuring out you know, how, how they think, what does their workflow look like? What does their day-to-day -day life look like? Um, what, are, what are like the things that are actually bothering them versus saying, hey, um, I think you might find this annoying. Do you agree? Like that's a very loaded question, right? So I think um, a lot of people, because we're in our heads all the time, the default reaction is often to start with the answer of like, oh, this must be annoying. Let me confirm that with you. But in reality, you know, an opening conversation with a potential customer should never be about confirming anything because you should really lay it all on the table and figure out like, what is it, what are they trying to say? And how do you learn, how do you reconstruct their world in your head so that you can better intuit how they would respond to the solutions that you're, uh, that you're building. Now, if you're building for yourself, I think that's kind of different because then you actually are the customer. So you can spend more time in your own head, but you need to validate that there are more people like you and there are enough people that you can reach like you to actually create a business. Because sometimes we're, you know, we're weird in our own ways. And there's like things that I would want that probably nobody else would want. And so before building it, I have to figure out, okay, are there actually other people that would want this. So that's like empathy with the customers. Um, I think empathy with teammates uh, is similar, but also like a little bit different in that um, I think one of the things that I took for granted when I was working at these different companies is you always think that you're doing so much work. Like, oh, I'm carrying so much low. Like I, the burden of the world is on me. But the truth is there are so many people on the team that take work away from you right? There are people who answer the support tickets. There are people who take care of all the designs. There are people who fight the bugs and all that stuff. And it's stuff that you don't have to do. So you can focus on your job. And I think appreciating, having a greater appreciation for all the things that are not on your plate, because someone else is taking care of it, that is really important. Um, and it's easy to forget, you know, because we're, again, we're always in our own world and we can we can overvalue our contributions and undervalue other people's contributions. Uh, and I think that, you know, as a PM, but really as anyone on a, on, a, on a team, it's so appreciated when you can see the other side and, uh, you know, actually verbalize that appreciation. Right. Yeah, that, that's a nice uh, outlook. I mean, definitely it feels lacking when we, uh, at least for from a very uh, technical or engineering perspective, we definitely aren't taught or at least it happens after a period of time that when we start working in workspace and we learn these things. So definitely it makes sense having an empathy or maybe just an understanding of surrounding uh, really makes sense. So, yeah. Um, but I was wondering if you if you can share an instance to learn more about how does it look like. For example, can you share with us an instance where you were given an assignment? Um, um, pardon me if, I, if the word is wrong, but if for example if you were given a task that you were supposed to do as a uh, as a part of your PM role, where I assume it was definitely not well scripted or definitely well not defined. I mean that would be a part of your job. So how how did you particularly take that uh, not so well defined or maybe reading between the lines to to maybe let's say giving out to the one to end phase where people try to scale and execute it so how does can you share share with us an instance how does it really look like well for example what are you typically given at what are the kind of things that you put in and how you how you make a skeleton that can maybe like sail on uh, for a long journey so can, can you share with, uh, with an instance if you can yeah sure thing so um i think that the ambiguous open-ended asks are are simply very common especially at earlier stage companies i think of bigger companies especially if you are coming in as a new pm uh, a manager is more likely to just 
really define what needs to be done and then it becomes easier for you to just take it. But at a startup, you know, very open-ended. I think an example of that would be when I first joined, uh, when I first joined FAIR, one of the big crises that they had was the return rates were through the roof. And so um, every day there would be like hundreds of new boxes that would arrive at the office, which was our returns warehouse. Our office was also our returns warehouse at the time. And so clearly there was a problem of, uh, look, there's a lot of returns coming in. And even though like our return rate is high, but also because we keep selling more, the boxes are never gonna stop arriving, even if you reduce the return rate, because on an absolute scale, it's just gonna keep going up. And so it's a very open-ended problem of like, okay, how do we fix this, right? And so I think when you have an open-ended task like that, it usually helps. And this is where I think the consulting background can be useful. Um, you take this big, hairy problem and you break it down into like, what are all the components of this? Um, and I like to think of it kind of like, as an equation almost of like, here are, these are your returned dollars. Um, there are ways in which we could solve it. So first is, you know, let's try to reduce the number of um, orders that require returns. And then you think through the whole flow of like, when someone makes an order, why do they return? Like, what are all the reasons? Let's look at all of the reasons why someone uh, are, is unhappy with this. Like, are there ways in which we can prevent uh, this many returns from happening? And then there's the other side of, okay, so the returns are here. We can't knock it down to zero. What are all the ways in which we can <clears throat> make this um, a better situation for us? Well, what does a better situation look like? Well, first of all, um, maybe have a warehouse that's not the office. <laughs> so we're not like <laughs> drowning in boxes, right? That's like maybe priority number one. And then there's, um, okay, so uh, instead of marking all of these returns down at a loss, like a complete loss, we could try to resell some of these returns. Okay, how do we resell them? There are, we could open up a channel on the marketplace. Um, maybe we will open up two different channels with like one is bundled, one isn't bundled. Um, maybe we try to resell this to some of other stores that look like the store and, and maybe have more capacity, right? So there's, there's all these different things you could do with an open-ended problem. But once you write down your solution, probably the most important thing is just start bucketing them into um, coherent like groups so that someone who is looking over your work um, or really any teammate who's trying to help out, like they understand, oh, these are, there's like three different options. Within each option, there's like five different solutions and we're gonna prioritize them based on like maybe uh, lowest effort, but highest impact. And so then we score all of the different options based on what we think will have the highest ROI. And then we go and do it. Um, but typically with a brainstorming process, and especially if it's a big, hairy problem, the number of solutions will exceed your ability to work on them properly. And so that's when you have a backlog. And that means that once you, you know, do a few things that hopefully will make an impact, you can ultimately leave like a roadmap for people to, in the one to end phase to continue working on chipping away at the problem. Um, so that way, you know, it, it's never really done. That's the thing, like the work is never truly ever done um, unless it's like a, you know, a project that it's a contract project. And it's like, this is the end point. Usually you can continue improving things, making things better, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but it's, you know, it's on you to draw the line on like, when do we think we should just shift priorities into something that's going to be higher value for you know, the goals that we have. Yeah, so I guess it, it's it's more about doing these segmenting and labeling those tasks what are involved that might be causing. And I guess uh, prior to, uh, if, if the product management wasn't done right, they wouldn't have these labels and uh, segmentation done very correctly and they would be based on someone's intuition and hence it be becomes a big question mark. So yeah, that makes sense. And, um, and one of the answers that you did mention is product management is a very broad role in itself for you to define. So for software development, we know these are the requirements, these are the qualifications, and you can, I mean, not 100%, but you can find a match according to your interest versus what the job requires. But product management is in itself very broad and it, it calls in for surprises. So how do you, how do you, uh, 
how would you suggest based on your experience of let's say i'm i'm, I'm a student with almost no experience because i just graduated maybe after one degree two degrees or three degrees how do if if, if i think i'm personally really motivated for a product management role how, what should i do in order to convince or maybe have someone look at my profile and say he might or he she might be a good fit for these roles mm -hmm. and what do you think uh, should be a prerequisite uh, for those roles is having an mba degree really necessary is having a technical skill really necessary uh, does having having the knowledge of coding and programming really aid into those things or is it something that you can grow into uh, in your career so uh, from a newbie's perspective what do you think they should be doing and focusing on to build their portfolio for a product management role mm -hmm. yeah so i think my i think my suggestion would vary again based on the person um i think for people who have already like domain expertise so let's say you did a phd in a specific topic um unless that person hates what they did and wants to leave that field forever i actually recommend leveraging that because that's something that's unique right not everybody can do a phd in a particular topic and assuming that that topic has commercial applications and that person wants to go into the private sector and work on those on those problems um, I, I think that that's actually maybe the right way to go. Um, like you have professors and those professors might know people who are working at companies or running companies. Using those, using that connection will be very useful because you already know something. You're like more knowledgeable than the average person who might be applying for a PM role or whatever. And also if you know the people and you have good ideas and you have a perspective because of what you studied, that's pretty perfect. I would, I would actually try to break in through that angle, start with a field that hopefully you don't hate, but that you have like good expertise in, because once you get the title, it becomes much easier to get the title again and again and again, because people don't want to take risks unless they know you. Right. And so if that's the case, like try to find someone who knows you, who's willing to take a risk on you. And then afterwards, people won't find you so risky anymore. It's the same thing of like Instagram would have never reached out to me if it weren't, or Facebook wouldn't have reached out to me if it weren't for the fact that someone had already given me an opportunity and I clearly was doing pretty well. And so it was de I was a de-risk hire for them and everybody wants de-risk hires for the most part. Um, so that's like one angle of you have a specific expertise already. Uh, let's say that you, you're a generalist, like for example, like I was a biology major, but like, I mean, it wasn't a master's, it wasn't a PhD, like I knew some things, but, and I didn't want to be in bio, right? So for me, I was starting from kind of like a, a clean slate. And I think in that instance, you know, plan A is you try to get a PM role, you, you know, talk to people, um, friends of friends, whoever you can think of, or maybe you target specific companies, you know, if you actually do have a, a strong preference and you offer uh, product feedback you use the product and you give them feedback as a customer. Like there's all these things that you can do to make yourself stand out as someone who takes action and is resourceful. So that's one angle. You can either really talk to people and, and try to, again, be a de-risk hire because someone can vouch for you, or you really stand out and just like, you're like there, you're, you're in the action, you're not sitting back and, and waiting for someone to give you an opportunity. That's another way of doing it. Um, if those things don't work out, if plan A doesn't work out, you don't get the role immediately, I would say plan B is you try to do things that will get you closer and closer to the role. And that's kind of what mm. I did looking back on it now of you have certain skills. Everybody does, right? Maybe you're good at talking to people. Maybe, you know, you're really good at writing or something like that. You're really good at math. I would say use what you have in terms of strengths and try to get closer to product development. So maybe you can start off as a data scientist. Maybe you can start off as, um, you know, like a, uh, a sales manager or something like that that gets you closer and closer to what gets built. Um, and I would say like, from what I've seen, internal transfers, meaning someone in the company from a different role transferring into the product management, it's very, very common. And why is it common? It's because they're de-risked. At that point, you, you are a known entity. You are known to be responsible. You care about the customers. You think well, people like you. And at that point, it's just, it becomes less of a, less of a, a, a tall order, right, to, to bet on someone. And so internal transfers are very common. They think that, you know, when people don't get it the first time, it doesn't mean the road is 
is over, right? It's <laughs> it's still beginning. Like you can still you can still go at it if that's really what you want. Um, and it's you know it's totally possible. It just takes a little bit more time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes sense. And and, and in terms of uh, the uh, process where they try to interview these candidates, uh, one thing that I have learned over the time is, uh, at least for technical interviews, we know there is an implicit uh, metric that uh, the interviewer is trying to look for is problem solving skills. So it it won't matter if I if I wrote a code that would compile and produce its results, but if if I approach the problem very correctly, or maybe if I'm having a suggestion on idea that really makes sense they would let go of the coding skills or the technical skills that i might not be able to perform at the moment uh, in the interviews what are some of the implicit uh, metrics that at least you as an interviewer if you're interviewing someone for a product management role you really look for that okay if it's it's fine if he doesn't know about my product at fair but if i look for this particular skills or this particular metric i think he or she is a good fit what are some of those uh, metrics that you personally think are a must for PM role? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so not all of the criteria is like necessarily quantifiable. Like it's not, you know, it's not like a test where you could really score it. It's more, I think it's more subjective. But I think one of the one of the big things that I feel like most people, almost every hiring manager looks for in, especially in PMs, but really in any role, is clarity of thought of when you speak, uh, whether it's about your own experience, whether it's, you know, talking through a hypothetical problem that the interviewer has given you, can you, can you communicate in a way that just makes a lot of sense, right? And, and one tip that people can use, that anyone can use to, to be more clear, is to think a little bit about what they're going to say before they say it. Um, so you can always ask for like, can I, you know, have a minute to just gather my thoughts? And no one's going to say no, like pretty much no one will say no. And that minute or two can give you the time to just structure your thoughts a little bit more. And if you can say, here's how I would approach it. Step one would be want this, step two would be this, or step two would be this, or let me tell you about my experience. The headline, mm -hmm. start with the headline, like what happened? And then let me give you the details, right? So I, I tell you why you should care. And then I actually tell you, the exact, like, let me, I'll walk you through the full scenario. I think that's really crucial. And the reason why that is, is because in a team, especially when you're remote, like you're communicating all the time. And if you're not clear in your communication, it actually slows the whole work down because people need to schedule extra meetings, back and forth, all that stuff. Not good. Um, so that's like probably the, the first thing is just clarity of thought. I think the second often is just, can you break down problems. You don't have to get to the right answer. Um, oftentimes there is no right answer, but if we give you like an ambiguous question where you could approach it from, you know, 25 different angles, can you actually explain how you would go about doing it in a way, again, that's clear. And so you actually like, again, segment, and you can do all those things that make it very clear that you have a plan. And that if we were to give you the problem tomorrow and you came in and this is your job, we wouldn't worry that you would have no idea what you're doing. Right. So that's like uh, the second thing is just like breaking down problems and explaining it. Um, the third, usually for, for PMs, is, is do you have empathy for the customers? This is hard to assess because if you don't know the customers, it's harder to display <laughs> empathy. Um, but one common question that a lot of people ask is, you know, what is your favorite product and why? And when you're talking about it in that way, I think there are people who can go like pretty detailed about what specifically they think is interesting from a, from a customer experience, from a business value perspective. Like there's all these ways in which you can, again, stand out and show that you have, you're not just using anything as a consumer, but you're using it as someone who is able to improve it and can think about like the next steps for that product. Um, so that's another thing that's like hard to assess often, but can really make a big difference. Those are probably the three main things for individual contributors. Um, for more, you know, senior roles, there's like, there's other parts like, oh, like, can you manage people? How do you deal with, you know, a bunch of, like conflict and, you know, can you figure out the right strategy, et cetera. But that would be, the baseline is are, are those things. 
and 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 you you did mention about the last point that you said like taking to the next steps right like if you are given something you can you extend it something based on your creativity and citing it back to something that you said was um it's you 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 never have the best solution right like it's it's a never ending process like you cannot say that this is done this is like the best version of this particular product and one thing that i have realized and this is from a very naive perspective is for big companies like google and apple they come up with these products who are who people are interacting with him which who 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 might not have who might have diverse backgrounds i would say somebody might not uh, somebody might be a medical professional versus somebody might not might not be educated and they are still using the products one thing that the question that always stays with me is there like if you are product management like if you are the lead like if you are the, the uh, top person on that particular product who is doing the product launch is there still always uh, does that always still remains a small factor of good intuition that comes within a with, without having a metric to it like saying like i know this will work i'm not sure why it will or maybe i know this will not work versus uh, it will does there always remain a small factor of intuition in your case too that you might not be able to quantify you might not not be able to say to your uh, self that why do why do i feel this is not going good versus this is really going great or or is it possible to really pin down all the metrics so that if let's say if i'm the person who is taking over your role in future can uh, can i can i step into your shoes and do exactly what you did in a better or similar sense is it possible to quantify everything or does that the does there always remain a small question mark of intuition that uh, brings in that brings in via experience i think or your background yeah so i definitely don't think everything is quantifiable especially in the moment um there are some things that are that are quantifiable in the long run but maybe not in the first two weeks or even the first month of launch um so one example with of that would be you know you like you may have launched something that makes it easier for people to sign up and so you get like a certain sign ups um but your overall retention like percentage of people who stick around might actually suffer and so net net you might not be even close to where you were before because you just brought in a bunch of people who are not interested in the product and that may not show up immediately but it will show up in the long run so that's an example of like quantifiable just takes longer to run its course i think there are also things that are that are just hard to pinpoint i mean like sometimes the, the negative like negative customer experiences need to build up before it really changes someone's um decision to to use a product or not use a product i think a lot of times you know products that um uh, that are honestly kind of bad it's not because of one thing it's like death by a thousand cuts like everything just <laughs> is a little bit slower a little bit more complicated and eventually it collapses um but prior to that nobody really knows it doesn't show up in the metrics etc i do think that that is definitely a thing on the negative side i think on the positive side like you may not always be able to quantify leading up to the launch because maybe it's a new product and nobody's ever used it before and you just have no historical basis um so the you know there's obviously examples of groundbreaking uh, products like that like it was hard to quantify like the electric car market but clearly tesla is doing pretty well um it was hard to quantify the smartphone market but obviously that changed you know all of our lives but after you launch if the thing is really what you say it is it should eventually become clear um especially if it's like a new product i i generally believe and i could be wrong but i generally believe that if something's a is going to be a massive hit like this version is going to be a massive hit you usually start seeing signs of it pretty early on you don't know for sure that it's going to be nearly as big as it is because it always will grow um but it's i think it's pretty rare for something to be a complete flop on day 1 day 7 day 30 and then without changing anything suddenly it becomes a huge hit i actually there might be exceptions to this but i think it's pretty rare and so i do think eventually like i think that you know there's a before and the after and so it sometimes always it's you need to make your case without metrics in the beginning but ultimately in a long enough time frame it should be very clear if something was actually good or not good um and then maybe the last part is there are some things that are 
that don't ever make enough of a difference. Like for example, I might really dislike the shape of this button. Um, and I might think that people are just, are just gonna hate this button. Um, but I may not ever be able to quantify it because it doesn't matter that much. Like it matters to me, but it probably isn't gonna matter to you or to the you know, thousands of other people who use this product. Uh, and so someone can say like, oh, let's just change it. And if it's not a big deal, fine, let's change it because it's really not gonna make a difference. Um, but I do think, yeah, but I think that there are some things that truly just like, you can't quantify because it simply does not need to be quantified. Um, but the big things, you know, like, is this gonna sell or not? Uh, is this going to make people happy or not? That should be able to be measured um, over a long enough time frame. Yeah. Yeah, and one thing that you said really sticked into me because uh, the thing that you said, if 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 that is a particular product, if it really satisfies what it tells it does, that really makes a good product. And uh, I definitely see these kind of good products versus bad products from a very naive perspective. Like when we see uh, Apple's iPhone versus some other product that is not so well defined, it really speaks. They they really make things very clear in their keynote talks and all those places. And we really see how much uh, good amount of efforts are being done into the products. So so yeah, that really means a lot that having a product that really does what it says, nothing less, nothing more, but gives people an idea of what they're really buying for and putting money for, that's, that really helps. And yeah, uh, one of the last questions I normally ask, at least for these kind of interviews, but I, I want to give it to you is for resources, like how do I get started? I could be any kind of person. So I could be a graduate student who has no experience in uh, product management versus like you said, the most common people are who are making the transition within the same workspace. So I, I know you have a great, um, I mean, I have personally been subscribed to that particular resources that you have on product lessons. Can you talk to more about like, what is that newsletter about? What are those articles about? And who is it for? Well, what, how would it help? And uh, feel free to plug in uh, whatever you want to, because I, I really find those in, uh, newsletters interesting from a very naive perspective. So I'll, I'll let you talk more about it. Yeah, sure thing. So I do have a newsletter um, getting close to 6,000 subscribers now. It's called productlessons.xyz. And it focuses on um, topics that I think, you know, are, are pretty common. Like it's just like, how do you build better products? How do you find mentors? Um, you know, how do you get an offer? How do you get, how do you get someone to give you a chance? So they're topics that I feel like are, have been addressed before, but the difference is that I will never write about something unless I have really actionable things to say about it that's like different. Um, I think the number one thing that people tell me they like about the newsletter is the fact that they can read it and they can figure out, easily figure out how do I apply this to my own life, especially if it's an opportunity that's within you know, my realm of possibility. Um, and that's, that's basically why I write these things. It's like to help me better, under, better internalize my own learnings, um, but also translate some of that to other people. So they don't have to be in the dark like guessing, like maybe this will work, maybe this won't work. Does this theory make sense? Like, let's forget about the theory. Let's talk about like, how do you actually take these next steps in your own life? So that's a newsletter. Um, I think that, you know, outside the newsletter for people who are just getting started, I, I really recommend talking to friends or friends of friends that you know in the role that you think you wanna be in. Uh, it's really important to get to know people and uh, especially if they have nothing to sell you, right? They're not trying to hire you. They can give you the honest truth about what they like and maybe even more importantly, what they don't like. And it's important to figure out if the things that they don't like are deal breakers for you, then you probably know that that specific role may not be a good fit for you. And I really encourage that because I think a lot of times, you know, it's easy to read articles and think, oh, that sounds amazing. Like I am gonna spend the next five years of my life doing that but you haven't done that yet, right? And, and the first proxy for actually doing it is to talk to someone who walked the path that you wanna walk and really get their thoughts on like the good, the bad, the ugly. You wanna know all those things uh, <laughs> because it'll save you a lot of time and anguish. The second best proxy um, is to actually try to do the thing. Like pretend you're, you're you know, the PM for this product, like what would you actually, do with it. And the first few ideas you have may not be that good, but you got to start practicing. And if it's not something that you think is interesting, like you don't want to be doing that all day, then you know that this role is not for you either. And I think this applies to pretty much any role. Like most things you don't need someone's permission to start practicing. You can practice by yourself. 
And I think that that like will put you far and above um, the vast majority of the population that just thinks about doing these things. Um, but of course, like the articles help and, and I really wanna, I try to make everything I write, um, you know, the best it could possibly be in this topic, especially for people who are newer and like want to figure out, you know, how do I actually do the thing? Uh, the other thing that I made uh, that was purely from readers feedback, like I did a round of interviews um, with people who are really engaged and, and figured out like, what is the, what is the, what, like, what are the things that stop them from being able to grow in their careers? And the most consistent theme I heard was, I'm not really sure how do I, how do I actually, how do I know I'm doing a good job? Like, how do I tactically manage my manager? Um, how do I actually prioritize a roadmap? Like I've heard all of these different frameworks, but I'm not really sure how to like put it into action. And so I made this product called Product Toolkit um, that's specifically designed around giving you the templates to put into action and, and also showcasing enough examples where you, where you actually understand what is this idea about? Um, and also explaining the why, like why does this work? Why does it not work? And then how do you actually, um, you know, how do you actually start taking action? And I do think that that action is like by far the most important thing to start taking. Like you're never going to, you're never going to be perfect, especially in the beginning, but taking that first step is so crucial. Um, and it just, most people never do it. Right. So it's another way to uh, make sure that you're much closer to whatever you want to do. Yeah, definitely. I, I definitely appreciate that because not it's not wide. Well, it's it's quite rare if you find good resources who can talk about a wide uh, wide set of topics, and it, especially for something some roles like uh, PM because they are fairly emerging. You cannot have a fixed answer. Whatever you wrote today might not be like or might be obsolete after ten years or so. So definitely, I definitely appreciate that, and I'll I'll leave a link to that particular um, uh, articles. So I would definitely, so anybody who's listening to this or maybe seeing this podcast can definitely have a look at it. But apart from that, um, thanks. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for being on this podcast. I really found this one really helpful because I myself, uh, I'm slightly uh, kind of interested along the pro product management roles, but definitely it's a long way for me. I'm just starting off with my PhD. So I, I'm really, uh, I'm really optimistic when you said uh, having a PhD has gives you an edge over if you really utilize it well so yeah, definitely I'm, I'm really optimistic about and happy with that uh compliment so yeah definitely uh but apart from that thanks uh, Lee, i i really i really found this podcast to be insightful and yeah i'll, I'll post out and I'll, I'll post out your linkedin uh over in the bottom too so that people if you have if they have any specific questions uh they can reach out to you so yeah twitter is better for me i don't i don't usually uh use linkedin but um, oh. but i always respond to my emails so they can also just email me okay I'll, I'll i'll leave a link to your twitter handle but apart from that thanks thanks for being here and uh, really really appreciate all your thank time. you jay this is really fun